Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good, good. So excited to be with you today. Let me ask you this. How many remember the, um, the What Would Jesus Do bracelets from when, when, like, the 90s or whatever? Anybody remember the What Would Jesus Do? I remember I had a few of those. Um, I was never one of the cool kids growing up. I know to some of you that's going to come across as, like, a huge shock. I, I wasn't popular with the ladies. I wasn't a cool kid. I wasn't any of those things. But um, uh, I, I remember growing up where all my friends were getting the What Would Jesus Do bracelets, and um, uh, I, I remember uh, not having one for a long time, and, and then uh, I remember getting one, and, and I was like, just thought I was the coolest thing, and it was great because it was a great way to say, like, hey, I'm a Christian, or I'm a believer, or whatever. It was a great way to, to kind of say, you know, to get people to ask, what does that mean? And then you can tell them about Jesus, and, and, and all of that. And uh, now, for a lot of you who don't know, that uh, saying, what would Jesus do, actually came about about a hundred years previous to the, to the bracelet slits coming out, or, or at least getting super popular where I live in Dade County, uh, uh, Miami, Florida. And, and it came, comes from this book, In His Steps, by Charles Sheldon. And, and this was a, a kind of a re- revolutionary book of its time. It actually, in back in, uh, I want to say right around the end of the 1800s, it sold 30 million copies, which was, was pretty impressive for a book at, at that time, uh, in that era, to sell 30 million copies. And, and Sheldon just basically asked the question. He walked people through their day-to-day life when it comes to how you handle this situation or how you handle that situation. When it comes to what do you do on your farm or what do you do when you're in school or, or, or what, what do you do in your day-to-day life? How, how do you ask the question or how do you apply the application to this question? What would Jesus do? And it's become a huge part of kind of our Christian culture or society in a lot of ways. It was very trendy. I remember, especially in the 90s, to wear this bracelet, and it became very popular. And, and so today we wanted to start a series kind of along the similar lines. But we, we began to ask this question, if there were some things maybe that, that have come into our Christian culture, our Christian heritage, uh, that, that maybe Jesus would not, not just want us to do, but uh, maybe there's some things that Jesus would want us to undo as well. And so today we wanted to start this series, What Would Jesus Undo? And when we read the teachings of Jesus, what broke Jesus' heart? What made him uncomfortable or bothered him so much so to the extent that he said, you know what, I can't deal with this or I'm going to begin to teach things that are, that are different than this. I don't want to see the church that I'm establishing uh, live this way or believe this way. What, would, what are some things that Jesus would actually undo? Let me ask you this. Have you ever gotten a gift from someone that you thought was like the perfect gift and they don't seem to like it? Has that ever happened to anybody? Like I'm married. I've been married about 12 years. And sometimes, especially around Christmas, I go to get my wife the perfect gift. And and I think that I found it. I know what what her favorite stores are. I know what her favorite clothing, you know, uh, designers are. I know all of these things. And so I I go and I try my best to find the perfect gift. And and inevitably, on Christmas morning, I get a, oh. Apparently, you've never been there. The oh is like, you thought I would like this? Like, that's what the O means, okay? If you've never clued into the O, then, then you, you're, you're, you're missing out. You, you thought you were doing good, but that means you didn't do good, all right? And so my wife, see, I, sometimes when I'm getting her a gift, I would get the, oh, oh hey, that, that, wow. Then I, I'm really lost for words. That's not a good thing, right? Like, lost for words is rarely ever a good thing. Unless you know the diamond is just so big, right? That's the only time that's a good thing, okay? Like, other than that, that's not a good thing. Now, I remember when, before we planted the church, our church is just right, just over a year and a half old, and, or two and a half years old, and, and I remember right before we planted, uh, there were several church planters that I, I wanted to go to their churches, and we took some of our team, and we went to hang out with them for the day, and just watch their services, learn everything that we could learn, watch their setup, watch their teardown, everything that we could get, or, or uh, everything that we could learn from uh, what they were doing, we, we just wanted to learn. And I remember thinking, okay, so these guys are established. Their churches are, are blowing up. They're doing really good. They, they've got a lot of people on a Sunday morning. Their systems are working so wonderfully. Everything about, I, I'm going to honor them by bringing them a gift. And so the day before we would drive, uh, you know, on the Sunday to go watch them and learn and do all that, the day before, 
I, I went shopping and I, I put together a big gift basket and, and I would uh, maybe ask their, their personal assistant, you know, what do they like? Do they like chocolate? Do they like this? Do they like that? You know, whatever. What, what, where do they shop? What are they? And so I could get them like not just a, uh, a hey, thanks kind of gift, but like something really nice. Something that they would like and enjoy. And I remember giving the gifts this one in particular where I felt like I nailed it. Like I had stuff for his kids. There was stuff in the gift for his wife. There was like a shirt that looked totally like him that he would preach in on a Sunday morning. I mean, it was just, it was just like a, a really, really awesome gift. And I remember him taking it and, and putting it down on his desk and never once saying anything about the whole gift. The whole day. That we hung out. Not one dime saying something. And I even kind of went, hey, you know, I hope that, did you notice in the gift there were some things for your kids? Just want to make sure you saw that and that the chocolate didn't melt before your wife got it. Hint, hint. <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks, man. Great. Yeah, that's great. That's all I got. And I was really bummed. I was kind of like, not hurt, like offended because that's a, my choice. But, but I was a little bummed. I was like, oh, come on, man. I, I put a lot of time and effort into this for you to just put it in the corner of your office somewhere and, you know, let your dog start getting on it, right? Like, that's not really what happened. But that's how, I, in my mind, that's how it all played out. Like, the, it was that he didn't care, nothing. And, and I was upset. And I began to ask this question. What do you think Jesus feels like when he left heaven... And he comes to earth to live as that which he created. He comes to earth to live as man, placing all of his godly attributes aside. And he gives up everything. He gives up literally everything his entire life to live in perfection, to face the worst capital punishment ever in history, to be beaten and to be broken and to be bruised and to be punished in ways that are way more severe than we could ever do justice in our own imaginations or on film. And to give us what? Every th access to the throne room of God to give us a, a spiritual purpose in our lives, to, to give us uh, the same power, John writes about, that the same power that dwelt in Jesus can dwell in us. In fact, John write, records, Jesus said, even greater things than these you will do. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, this gift of salvation through the cross, the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And a lot of times as believers, I feel like we, we take that gift because we want to make sure the eternal things are good. We, we want to make sure, you know, when we die, we're going to be all right. Everything, so we're going to go spend eternity with you. We, we take the gift, but when we realize the extent of everything that comes along with the gift, we kind of go, eh, or, oh, hey. And for some of us, we set the gift aside. And my name is Nathan. I'm the lead pastor here at Ridgeline. I'm super excited to be with you this morning, especially if you're checking us out for the first time. Just honored that you'd worship with us today. I'd love to invite you to Starting Point uh, right after service today. And if you have questions about who we are as a church, or you'd like to meet my wife and I, or you want to know what happens to your money when you give, or how you can be involved, maybe you love, to, um, you, you love hospitality, you'd love to be a part of our First Impressions team, or, or you're creative, or you're techie, or you love hanging out with kids, or whatever it is, we've got a great place for you uh, here at Ridgeline. We want to not just have a place for you to attend church, but allow our church to be an opportunity for you to be the church. And so starting point, just a few minutes after service today, we'll have coffee and snacks for you. I'd love for my wife and I to get a chance to hang out with you. We want to hear your story, get to know you better, and uh, help you uh, answer any questions that you have uh, about our church. And so that's uh, just coming up in just a few minutes. Have you ever noticed with our, it seems like with my generation and younger that it's, uh, there's this kind of this meh generation? You ever, you ever been talking to your kids or your teenagers and they're kind of like eh or meh or whatever? And you, you hear that a lot. In fact, there's now a spelling for meh, M-E-H. You might see it in text messages from time to time or it's usually followed by an exclamation point. Like they're really overemphasizing the meh. Like, like, it's just, it's, it's it, and it means basically if you don't know, if you've never, anybody's not said that to you, it just means like, ah, I don't care. Like, oh, okay, what does that have to do with me? And it seems like that that's new to our generation, or at least the generation younger than me. But it's not. 
It's not a new thing. We've all had, each generation has had their kind of way of saying, I don't care about my parents' generation in their own way. Each generation has kind of had their way of kind of going, and maybe it wasn't M-E-H, meh, or, or whatever. It was like, you know, it, it was other ways to say, ah, I don't care, that's not for me, that's, that's like, that's, that's for you, that's old people music, that, that's, you know, that's an old way of saying, you know, certain things, that's, you know, that's for you hippies, or that's for, you know, whatever it is. And what I find interesting is in the book of Revelation, Jesus writes letters to seven churches. Jesus writes letters to seven churches, and one is kind of like, nah, when it comes to spiritual ideas or when it comes to spiritual discipline. When it comes to passionately living for uh, the, the, the passionately living and, and accepting and following through on the gift that Jesus provided for us at Calvary. And it becomes, they're kind of, when it comes to their spiritual disciplines, when it comes to being passionate followers of Jesus, they're kind of go, meh, it's not, eh, like we want the eternal part of salvation, but we don't want the here and now part that changes our lives, makes us live differently. And this church that I'm referring to is in a city called Laodicea. It was a very wealthy city, an incredibly wealthy city. And in fact, 35 years prior to this letter that Jesus writes, uh, the, the whole city was destroyed by an earthquake. And the city has been rebuilt. And it's not just been rebuilt like up to par. It's been rebuilt way above the standards of the time. It is incredibly lavish. They, they build huge theaters in the city. There's massive stadiums. There's beautiful public bathhouses. Uh, there's these big shopping centers. It, it would really be the modern equivalent to like Vegas or Dubai or, or anything along those lines. Like that, that's, the, that's the type of city that Jesus writes this letter to. In the book of Revelation. But the city has a major problem. A really big problem. In fact, they have inadequate water supply. And so the city decides, they come up with this elaborate plan, that they're going to pipe in water from two surrounding cities. They're going to pipe in water. Now, one of the cities that they're, surra- that they're piping in water from is up in the mountains. And so, of course, the water running down off the mountains and coming down off the mountains is very cool and it's very pristine and refreshing. And then the other city that they pipe in water from has beautiful hot springs that are very, very warm. And so they begin to, they begin to, to uh, this elaborate system of piping in both cold water and hot water. And it's just this, it, it, it's this wonderful system they come up with. The problem is the amount of distance that this water has to travel, the water has become completely lukewarm by the time it arrives in Laodicea. It becomes, it's dirty by the time it gets there. It's tepid. And the temperature is unpleasing, unbeneficial in any way. Because it's not hot water, and it's not cold water. And so Jesus writes a letter to the church in Laodicea, to this community of believers in this city, and he tells them about something that he wants them to undo. He wants them to begin the process of undoing something that they've begun to allow happen in their culture as a, as a family of faith or as a community of faith. And while he's, while he's writing this letter and trying to uh, give this example, he, he, he uses an analogy that they are all too familiar with. He uses an analogy of water. And here's what he says. Here's how it starts. Here's where we're going to pick up today's portion of Scripture. Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 15. If you have your Bibles, feel free to turn there. If not, the, um, the Scriptures will be up on the screen behind me. So here we go. This is what Jesus is saying in the revelation that he gives to John to the church in uh, Laodicea. And this is what it says. I know your deeds. I know your deeds. Now, this is a pretty uh, crazy way to, to, to it's, pr- uh, it's a pretty crazy thing to say to somebody. Uh, like, remember the movies a couple years ago? Of course, I'm, I'm Christian, so I didn't see these movies. But I know what you did last summer. Remember those movies? All right. Remember that? Like they, they knew what happened. Anyway, so this is what Jesus is saying. Listen, I know what you do from week to week. I, I know what's going on in your houses. I know what's going on in your church. I know what's going on in your heart of hearts. I know your life. I know what you did. I know how spiritually passionate you are. I know how much energy you're putting into furthering the gospel or not putting into furthering the gospel. I know. 
This is what Jesus says. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. That you are neither cold nor hot. In other words, that you are kind of just meh when it comes to spiritual things. When you're cold or hot, like what? Well, they, of course, Jesus is using the analogy of the water that flows into their city. I know that, uh, that, that you're not cold, which has a great purpose. It's refreshing. It's, it's good for, for storing food. It's good for lots of different cold water. is great. I, I know that you're not hot, which is also a positive, a good thing. It has medicinal purposes. It, it, it's good to get clean with. It, it, it's great. There's a lot of, I, but I know that you're neither of those. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold... I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Because you're neither hot or cold. Now, I remember growing up in old school Pentecostal churches. And they they would manipulate this portion of scripture to say that God wanted you to be hot, not lukewarm, or not kind of meh, or really far from God. That's what they equated cold to. He would rather you be really far from God than to be lukewarm. That is an improper interpretation of this portion of Scripture. Both of, the, both of the, 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 the feeds of water that came to the city had good purposes. God is saying, Liz, I, I want you to be useful one way or the other, but just don't be lukewarm. He's not in any way saying, I wish you were cold. I wish you were far from me. I wish you were, that's better. No, he's not, he's not saying that at all. Now, what's interesting about this that, that the, the translators uh, nicely uh, uh, put in here was it, it says the word spit, but the, the little, literal translation here is vomit or spew. Like, it's not just like, oh, that's lukewarm. Let me just spit it out. The picture here that Jesus is writing to this church is that your lukewarmness turns my stomach to the extent of I'm not just trying to spit you out it makes me want to puke you're so spiritually stale it makes me want to puke it doesn't just break my heart it literally turns my stomach And if your answer to the question of how are you doing spiritually is kind of, eh, then I believe that's something that Jesus wants to undo in your life today. So what would Jesus undo? I believe he would want to undo first and foremost spiritual indifference. So there are two causes of spiritual indifference that I want to share with you this morning. Here's here's the first one is self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency. Now this is a a crazy one. Because it kind of goes against uh, everything that we've been taught as as Americans or as, you know, folks who grow up here in the West. It kind of goes a bit like, you know, I'm an independent woman and I don't need a man. It kind of it kind of goes again. I'm not saying that firsthand. I'm saying like, you know, just the saying. You've heard the saying. Some of you look like you've never heard that saying. I didn't say it from me, all right? It wasn't. But we're taught to be independent. We're taught to be self-sufficiency or the illusion of self-sufficiency. Back a couple verses later, Jesus deals with this in the letter in verse 17, and this is what he says. He says, you say, I'm rich, I have adequate wealth, and I do not need a thing. Because remember, they're very wealthy. This is Vegas, this is Dubai, this is a, a big you know, city that has a lot, of, a lot of different things going for it. You may say, I'm rich, I have adequate wealth, I, I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. When it comes to the condition of your spirituality, you may say in the physical, yeah, I've got enough money, I have savings, I, I've got my you know, Dave Ramsey six months emergency fund, I, I've got all those things, and those things are great. I'm not knocking any of those things. Financial wisdom is, is a great thing. Solomon talks a lot about it. But if you only have financial security and you don't, you don't have any kind of spiritual uh, growth in your life, then man, God says, according to God, th- then you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. 
In fact, that's what I love to tell everybody that comes here to our church. <laughs> Just kidding. And what, what that really is, is, is it's, it's selfishness, and it's, it's things like, you know, jealousy dressed up as moral superiority. It, it's things like, you know, most of us, we've kind of outgrown that childish, selfish stage when it comes to a lot of things, but, but what we do, it, it always, we don't always outgrow the, the reality of our, of our real selfishness. And if you were to look at, you know, the things that this city possessed and, and what's, what's going on, all of their wealth, and their finances, so that you can feel good about what you have or how you handle yourself. But you know what? Jesus says that this is what prevents spiritual growth, self-sufficiency. Look what I have. Look what I've got. We talk to people, we see this in our culture all the time. You go to tell somebody about Jesus or you talk about Jesus and they kind of get the, ah, I'm good, right? You ever, you ever done that? You go to tell somebody about Jesus, hey man, Jesus loves you, ah, I'm good. It's like, ah, I didn't, I'm not trying to sell you anything, ah, I'm good. Like, okay. And, and people, that's how it is. People have their, they have it, we have in our culture everything we need. We have our coffee and our Starbucks and our iPhones and our Amazon Prime and, and we have our Snuggies and we have our Netflix and sometimes we have our Netflix and chill and, and we have everything that we could ever want as a society and we have what we need. We have both, most of our basic needs taken care of, but we're spiritually bankrupt. We're spiritually bankrupt. We don't have everything that we need. We have a life full of stuff, empty of meaning. We live our life full of our things and empty of purpose or meaning. So here's number two. Number two, two causes of spiritual indifference. Distractions of this world. So the first one, Self-sufficiency, the second one is distractions of this world. Now, Jesus tells this parable. I love this in, in Mark chapter 4. Jesus tells this great parable. And this is one of my, probably one of my top three favorite parables. Not, not number one, but probably top three. And Jesus tells this parable about a farmer sowing seed, and he's just kind of sowing seed. And it seems like, you know, he has a designated area where he sows seed. But as he's going, uh, uh, trying to get as much out as, in as little time as possible is what it seems like. Some of the seed falls in different places. Some falls on the path. Some fall on rocky soil. Some so fall on uh, uh, where there's thorns. And some fall on, uh, hopefully, a majority, if he's a good farmer, a majority falls on good soil. And the seeds, the, the seeds begin, they, they go into the soil, they die, they begin to grow. And here's where we pick up the story, Mark 4, uh, starting verse 19. But, but the worries of the life, of this life, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the deceitfulness of wealth. See, isn't that what Jesus was just talking about in the letter to Laodicea? You think you have everything that you need, but you're poor and you're wretched and you're broken and you're naked, Right? He said, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come and choke the word, making it unfaithful, unfruitful. Making it unfruitful. He said, listen, and we've all been there. This is my story for a lot of times in my life where I hear a good message, I hear a good sermon, or I'm in a small group and I, I hear a good, uh, I hear, you know, good, we're, we're doing a good curriculum or we're, we're learning about something or somebody says something that I've never heard before. And, and, and man, that really stirs me up and gets me pumped on the inside and I get really excited about it, but, but then it begins to grow inside of me, but then out of nowhere life happens, Right? And you determine, maybe you're like me, you know, you say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray 30 minutes every day this week. And day one, you pay, you, you know, you, 30, and day two, it's like, you know, 14, and, and day three, you didn't even think about it. What happened? Life happened. Everything that you intended to do, what, it got choked out. It got choked out by life. 
And then next week, we're going to be launching our fall small group semester. So make sure that you're, uh, if you haven't had a chance to sign up to be a small group leader, if you're interested, uh, then, then you can do that at our central hub. And, um, but if, if you have, uh, just next week, we'll be launching and, and we'll have a whole list and there'll be a lot of fun stuff that you'll be able to do. But let me recommend, if you've not been through our freedom small group, where we walk you through uh, biblical steps to freedom, man, you need to do freedom. And don't go, nah, I don't need it. You do. You do. Do the freedom one, all right? But life happens. You intend to do the right thing. You intend to do all the good stuff. You intend for, for, for you know, I'm going to pray this much. I'm going to read my Bible this much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell people about Jesus. But then you've you got bills to pay. And, and, and there's, you know, places to be and people to meet and selfies to take. And there's dishes and laundry. And the kids have to be at practice. And there's oil changes and PTA. And, and you have to save the unborn. And you have to save the whales. And you're supposed to stop using straws. And there's just so much. There's so much. And it, what does it do? It chokes it out. And, and this week, you're not supposed to wear Nikes anymore. And like, there's just, there's so much. There's so much. And it chokes it out. What was planted and even begin to develop inside of us begins to be choked out by the deceitfulness of wealth, desire for other things, or the cares of this world as legitimate as they may be. And here's the problem that I've noticed with a lot of people, and I, I, again, I'm, I'm not saying this from up here to you down there. I've dealt with this. A lot of times we want a little bit of Jesus, but not too much Jesus. We, we want enough to make us feel better, uh, enough to make sure that our eternity uh, is taken care of, enough to make sure that we're not going to hell, enough to make sure that, you know, like our parents aren't on our backs too much because we're going to church on Sunday, enough to make sure that, you know, if we need something, then he's going to be there, but not enough that it changes the way that we talk behind closed doors or, or not enough that, that it, you know, it makes us uh, have to tell people about Jesus or not enough that it, that it alters the way that we live just enough that the eternity things are taken care of. And what would Jesus undo? Jesus would undo lukewarm indifference because it doesn't just break his heart. It turns his stomach. So here, I want to give you a few things for a few moments. How do you know if you're living with lukewarm indifference? So here's the first one. You're more concerned with impressing people than we are with God. More, inser- more concerned with impressing people than we are living for God. If when you become in your life more concerned with what will people think about me than worrying about, man, what does God ask me to do in this situation? What would Jesus want me to do? Then you've become indifferent. Timothy writes that, 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 that in the end times there'll be, there'll be people who are there'll be more lovers of self than there'll be lovers of Jesus and, and, and woe to people who, who uh, th- that everyone speaks well of do you know there's a scripture verse that says woe to you if everyone speaks good about you that if everyone that you know talks good about you then there's something wrong and I don't mean that you should become this, this radical, mean, Bible-thumper type person, but like, like the, gospel, the, the gospel says about itself that it's offensive. To tell somebody that they are, they, are, they are a sinner in need of a Savior, that's offensive. That's offensive. The gospel is offensive. That's why we do what we do as a church, to try to make every environment as life-giving and as warm as possible so we don't offend them 20 times on the way in people on the way in so when they come to the gospel portion they're already super offended and no care never going to come back anyway we don't want to be that kind of church number two we're obsessed with life on earth rather than eternity we become more obsessed with life on earth 
than we do with eternity. Here, here's the crazy thing is that, that our days on this earth are numbered. Eternity is not numbered. And we spend all of our energies, all of our efforts concerned about the, the numbered portion of our lives when scripture says that we are eternal beings that will go on to live forever. And we pay so little attention to that portion. We, we do such little preparation for that portion of our lives. We rationalize sin and live without truly fearing God. Rationalize sin and live without truly fearing God. This is, this is so crazy because, I, man, I catch myself doing this. Oh, it's not a big deal. I mean, compared to, <laughs> compared to my wife, I'm doing really good. <laughs> just kidding. She's in kids. She's just not hearing this. And it'll be our secret. No, I'm just kidding. She's the saint. She puts up with me. compared to, and I'm doing really good. I mean, you know, what? I, it's not hurting anybody, what I do. You know, it's just a white lie. It's just a, you know, and, and, and we recategorize things and we re rename things. It, it's the, you know, it's adult entertainment. It's not pornography. It's just a movie with a, a really graphic sex scene. Or, or it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's not, you know, it's everybody at the office gossips. It's not really a big deal. Or, or, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's an affair. It's not adultery. I mean, there's a big difference, right? We rationalize our sin and live as if our sin wasn't the reason Jesus had to come and die, be beaten, take capital punishment that was awful. Number four, we believe in Jesus but we rarely share our faith. <laughs> now, Jesus said, if, if, if you confess me before men, I'll, I'll, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. If you don't, I won't. Like That's kind of a prerequisite that we share our faith. That we share our faith. And you, you may not have, you know, all of the, like we, we have, we're so blessed as a church to have uh, Tony who's traveling this week because of work, but Tony is the COO of Evangelism Explosion. He spoke just a couple of weeks ago, shared with us again how to share our faith. And you may not have all those tools or memorize all those things, but you have your own story. And you know what God's done for you recently. And you can share that. And you know what? For a lot of people, that'll be way more valuable than you working through a, a template and, and I'm not knocking in any way the template. I, I love the template. I, I learned it and use it. It helps you make sure you get through the, the sound theology of the gospel. But the power is not in the template. Number five. Here we go. We only turn to God when we need him. Oh, this one's tough. We only turn to God when we need something. Rather than seeking him daily and making that a part of our life where we just get alone with God and say, God, what's on your mind today? What's on your heart today? What do you care about? We only seek him when, when it benefits us. He's a tool that we use in our arsenal of ways to get things done. Not a God that we fear or worship. Number six. We're not much different from the world. We're not much different from the world. We watch the same movies. We enjoy the same music. We, we you know, have the same morals or have the same moral standard or, or you know, we raise our kids mostly the same way or, or we spend our money the same way. The divorce rate in the church is the same as it is not for people who don't go to church. We just, it's all the same. And that's true that I believe it's something Jesus wants to undo in his church we become indifferent because life chokes out the passion that we have for Jesus we become indifferent we've been living with spiritual indifference uh, it's not it, we've not been hot which is useful we've not been cold which is useful but we've become stagnant and lukewarm 
We get asked, you know, do you want to go to church today? Eh. You know, not if the weather's too bad or, or too good. If it's too bad, you know, we don't want to really get out. And if it's too good, we'll go for a hike or we'll go this or we'll go there. Or we'll go that. You want to be a part of a small group this upcoming semester? Eh. You know, I don't know a lot of people. Do you want to use your gifts that God's given you to be a blessing to the local church? Eh, man, I don't, I don't know. You want to tell somebody about Jesus today? I'd rather not. Seems offensive. I'd rather just invite them to church. Nathan will take care of it. You want to be a blessing with your finances and your resources? Eh, you know, I, I was saving up for something else. Lukewarm indifference doesn't just break God's heart. It turns his stomach. It turns his stomach. Let me, let me help you. I'm going to do you a favor here this morning. Here it is. You ready? Fast forward to the end of your life. As you look back on your life, you may have regrets. And in fact, if you, if you remain indifferent towards the things of God, you will have regrets. And I want to save you those regrets. You won't be thinking at the end of your life, I wish I did save up for that bigger car, that bigger boat, that bigger motorcycle, that bigger whatever, that newer, that newer house, the newer, you know, I, I wish we really would have bought that third property on the golf course. I wish we really would have done this or done that. That will not be a regret for you in your old age. I wish I had more. I wish I did more. Fun type stuff. But you will come to the end of your life say, I wish I'd followed Jesus more passionately. I could have given more. I could have been a more godly parent. I, I, could, have, I could have gone on more missions trips. I, I could have done this more. I could have done that more. I could have made a greater difference in my state for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I could have raised my kids in a way that lined up with who God had called them to be. Specifically, because I prayed over them every morning and prayed over them every night and I knew who God had called them to be. I don't know who this is for, but I'll just tell you this. This is where Crystal, my wife and I are at. We have two girls, nine and 10. They're about to be 10 and 11. They're just missed being Irish twins by like one month because my wife had health problems. So we weren't supposed to be able to have kids. So we had two back to back. Thanks, doctors. They're, they're a blessing. The first one is a blessing and the second one is a, is a miracle that we even had a second kid and also a blessing. You know, we raise both of our girls differently. We don't raise them exactly the same because they have different personalities and they have different callings. And sure, as their parents, I don't know everything that God's going to use them to be or whatever, but as they get older, I'm watching God begin to refine some of those things so we can begin. And my wife and I, even yesterday, had a conversation that said, she said, and it was something that's been in my heart for a long time, she said, I believe that Cambria is called to, to be this as her spiritual gifting, and, and so that means that we need to raise her like X, Y, and Z because of her calling. Different than Isley. Different. Raise your kids according to their calling. If you don't know their calling, then man, pray and ask God. And fast forward to the end of your life. If you don't live like this, you'll regret it. And I want to save you that heartache and regret. I don't want you to come to the end of your life and go, man, I, I should have done more. I wish I could have done more. I wish I would have done more. So what do you do if you realize that you've become spiritually indifferent. What do you do? How do you fix it? What's really easy, I want to share with you 25 things. <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, it is. It's really easy. Re reigniting your spiritual fat passion. Here's what you have to do. Read the word, pray, witness, fellowship with other believers, give, worship, turn from your sin. That's, that's it. That's all you have to do. Those seven things. Now that's how you get from zero to 100, all right? That's a lot. Like, I get it. Some of you are going like, 
What do you mean that's it? That's a lot. Where do you start? Here's where you start. Every day, do something that requires faith. Every day. Every day. I don't know if I can do seven things for a week straight, let alone for the rest of my... Okay, that's fine. You, can't, you, can't, you don't have enough time. We'll start somewhere and start here. Every day, do something that requires faith. Do something. Be led by the Spirit of God to, to do something that you couldn't do or that you wouldn't do without God. Every day. I remember as I began to think about this, and I, I try to live that way, but I, I never put it into words specifically that every day I need to do something that, that requires faith. And I, I remember yesterday being at the gym. And I'm only telling you this story so I can throw in the part about being at the gym. I, I remember yesterday, and I remember seeing a couple that I'd never seen before because I usually work out through the week and not on the weekend. That's why my arms are looking so good today. Whoa. <laughs> Thanks. I got, um, I got your lunch covered, all right? I remember, and I saw this couple come in that I'd never seen before. Actually, we approached the door together, and I forgot to bring my key card thing, and they, they opened it, and I held the door for them. They went in. And I'm watching them work out, and I, I, I don't know this couple before. And, and I remember as I'm uh, getting towards the end of my workout and kind of going, like, for some reason, I just keep seeing this couple over and over and over again, wondering. One of the guys had, uh, the husband uh, had a, t- uh, a scripture verse tattooed on his arm. And uh, so I thought, you know, I should ask him about the scripture verse. Just, you know, strike up a conversation. Maybe, maybe they're far from God and, and I can share the gospel with them or invite them to church or wherever the conversation leads with the Holy Spirit leads. And then I'm on the treadmill and, and, and I'm, I'm working out and I remember hearing, feeling like I heard the Lord say that they just recently had a tragedy in their life and so why don't you just go and say, you know, hey, you, you know, and, and so I, I have this thing, you know, hey, my name's Nathan and uh, this may sound weird. I usually start like that. That, that you know, the Lord... Uh, you know, did you, or, and then I'll ask him a question. Do you guys just recently have a tragedy in your life? Where there's, and just, you know, I'm Nathan. I, I, Jesus loves you. Can I pray for you? That kind of thing. That's all I was going to do or say. You know what? Doing that required faith. It required faith. It required the willingness to look stupid. You want to know what the, the ironic part? Because I was thinking about this message while I'm doing that. Like, yeah, they're going to have a major tragedy and I'm going to start praying. They're going to break down to repent, to give their lives to Jesus. It's going to be a great story for tomorrow. There was nothing wrong with their lives. They had no problems. Like, it wasn't, there's no victory in this story other than I stepped out in faith and did what, and they said, oh yeah, well, I appreciate it. And so I just said, hey, if you guys go into a season where, you know, maybe some things start to fall apart or that you need, it doesn't look like it's happening. Just know God's got the big picture. Man, I appreciate you having the guts to come tell me that. That's all, that's all that happened. I don't have some killer story to tell you about that this week. There's a lot of weeks I do, and I've shared some of those stories from time to time. But the worst case scenario happened. I, I, I missed it. I got it wrong. And it still all turned out okay. But what did I do? I decided that that day I was going to do something in faith. I was going to do something in faith. What did I do today that required faith is a great question to ask yourself at the end of every day. Did I stand up for something or someone that while everybody else was picking on or gossiping about, did I stand up? Did I give to someone a need, even if it stretched me? Did, Did I apologize to someone that I've really been needing to apologize to? Did, did I offer forgiveness to somebody that maybe has never even asked for an apology? Did, did, I, did I pray out loud, maybe in my small group or in my time with my kids or around the dinner table when we've never really been that type of family that prays, that's quite prayed out loud before? Maybe did I, did I go to a small group or start or sign up? Or maybe lead one. I've been in one for a couple of semesters now, but did, maybe did I, did I, I'm going to sign up to lead. Did I reach out to someone that God's put on my heart? Maybe that I don't even know. Did I expose myself to something that, that I know breaks God's heart? Did I listen to a podcast from a missionary in Africa somewhere in the backwoods where the, the conditions are just so dreadful? That even though I, I, I'm going to do it, but I know in doing it, it's going to break my heart. 
that I pray for something way bigger than myself? Did I start something that's way bigger than myself? Why? Scripture says, because without faith, it's impossible to please God. You know, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And James writes that faith without works is dead. And so in other words, what we can take from understanding uh, what we know about faith is that faith brings life. It brings life to our spiritual walk. It brings life to our spiritual condition. It brings life to, to the, uh, those around us. It brings life into our homes and our, and our communities and our families and, and our churches. It brings life. Faith brings life. When we've been operating in spiritual indifference, beginning to exercise our faith will bring life back to our relationship with Jesus. When you do, you'll be more concerned about what God is calling you to do or or to be than you are about what people think about you. And when you do, suddenly you're living for for what lasts rather than for what doesn't last. You'll be living for the eternal, not for the temporal. And and when you do, uh, instead of uh, of rationalizing your sin, you'll realize that, no, I'm called to live uh, to be a a holy people. I'm called to live a a righteous life. And and I confess my sins and I I ask God to forgive me. And, And when you do, you... You, you, you'll have bold faith and people will be amazed by your boldness. And, and when you do, you, you'll not just be turning to God when you need him, but you'll daily be, be, be uh, in fellowship with God. And one day, you'll wake up and you'll realize that you're different. And that because every day you've asked yourself, what have I done that requires faith? You wake up and realize that you have become a passionate follower of Jesus. You realize that you haven't been conformed to the patterns of this world. Paul writes in Romans that you've been transformed. That you're no longer indifferent, but that you have godly purpose. Let me just say, having godly purpose may be tough, but it's way better. It's way better. It's better to hurt with a purpose than to exist without one. So what would Jesus undo? I believe Jesus would want to undo lukewarm indifference because it doesn't just break his heart. It turns his stomach. And after this gift that Jesus gave us, right standing with God the Father, purpose, power, and authority, that gift we have an obligation to live as passionate followers of Jesus. So what do we do every day? We ask ourselves, what's the one thing that I did today?